Um, so it is an honor to be with you today. Uh, thank you, D'Angela, for bringing this event together so tremendously. Uh, I'd also like to thank Celie McInnes, who edited and published a very long article of mine um, in a print, uh, special prints issue of Black Magnolia, uh, which has a booth in the expo, so you could check that out. Um, this talk is adapted from that article, It's called, uh, which was called How the Exodus Began, Prints in the Black Working Class Imagination. So today I'm going to tell you a story, and it begins with one word, legacy. That Prince's father, John L. Nelson, was a jazz pianist, is frequently noted in Prince's biographies. Less often discusses that Nelson, like Prince's mother, Maddie Della Shaw, was descended from enslaved Africans and moved from Louisiana to uh, Minneapolis in the late 1940s. And almost never mentioned is that John L. Nelson worked for 35 years at the Honeywell Corporation in uh, Minneapolis as a plastic molder. According to a profile in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Nelson made rheostats for furnaces. These are the, uh, the devices that regulate electrical current. And it was hands-on work, working class work. So according to um, Nelson's oldest daughter and Prince's half-sister, Sharon Nelson, John L. would go to work at 7 a.m. When he came home after the kids went to bed, Nelson would stretch his hands out across the piano keys and play all night. You might imagine that his fingers move hesitantly. He cracks his knuckles, freeing the tension of a day's work. Does he dive into something new, um, a melody he hummed at work, or does he warm up with a familiar composition, maybe one of his own? What songs are on his mind? What is he remembering uh, from his day at work or trying to forget? That sounds like a Bruce Springsteen song. And in fact, it very nearly is a Bruce Springsteen song. It's called Factory. The burdened working man father figure is a common hero in the American imagination, tragic or comic, put upon, stoic, anxious, optimistic. Not freaky, frequently enough, though, is he black. Not often enough, though, is that working class hero a black woman. Maddie Shaw got a master's degree in social work and dedicated the rest of her life to working in the Minneapolis school system. A decent living, but economically a working class life. Prince came up from a black working class family and community on Minneapolis's north side. And in his music from the beginning, he often spoke to and for and about a black American working class that aspired to prosperity, safety, and sustainability while under continual assault from inst institutionalized racism. For instance, Purple Rain is a black American working class film, but in 1984, it was Springsteen's Born in the USA that was labeled by the mainstream press and exploited by Ronald Reagan's election campaign as America's working class anthem, not Purple Rain. In addition to an alliance of conservatism and neoliberalism that was actively targeting the black working class, it didn't help that white journalists and music critics were unable or unwilling to articulate the intersections of race and class and had been unable or unwilling to see Prince's Dirty Mind era bikini briefs or his purple trench coat and ruffles as having anything to do with blackness, let alone the black working class. Now, the crucial thing here, and I'm gonna tell you here today, is that Prince's thinking about class, economics, and race evolved throughout his career. As a product of the civil rights generation, he was taught to believe in the values of integration, and undoubtedly this informed his vision of Uptown, a pluralistic, free, democratic society where black, white, Puerto Rican, everybody's just a freaking. This was an ideal. And in so many of his songs from the 1980s, that's what he performed, a utopian ideal. But he understood the reality. And in the 1980s, that reality included what Carol Anderson concisely details in her book, White Rage, as the Reagan administration's rolling back of the gains made by black Americans during the civil rights era, including federal funding for the cities, student loans, K through 12 nutrition programs, and so forth. The black unemployment rate had been decreasing before 1980, but under Reagan, it increased. And unemployment among African-American youth was a staggering 45.7%. The growth rate of both the black working class and middle class stagnated. The scholar Mark Anthony Neal has noted that by this point in time, quote, under the banner of urban renewal, 
the black working class and working poor were marginalized and isolated from the engines of the post-industrial city and instead exposed to intense poverty and rampant unemployment, which subsequently challenged traditional desires to maintain community. So during this time, Prince confronted what it meant to be a so-called crossover superstar. Beginning with Purple Rain and through Parade and under, under the Cherry Moon, some folks in the black community felt that Prince had abandoned the community although I suspect this was at least in part ginned up by the corporate press. In any case, with Sign of the Times, Prince had a new uh, mainly black band and an album that Greg Tate, Village Voice critic and co-founder of the Black Rock Coalition, described lovingly as being too black, as in too funky. However, speculation about the black album being shelled for Love Sexy reignited the debate to some degree, including Prince's supposed disdain for hip hop and rap. I'd love to talk more about that, but for now, let me say that regardless of the truth of that situation, rap in the late 1980s was having a vital conversation within and about the Black working class, and Prince was not in it. He may have considered himself to be championing Black working class values and visions, but if so, it was in a way that sought liberation within the capitalist system. Even in Sign of the Times and Love Sexy, there's more than a hint of the liberal-minded pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps self-empowerment ideology. While I think this was on behalf of a Black working-class imagination in America, it was still more focused on its possibilities than its current realities. And then something began to change. I can't tell you exactly why it changed. I can only look and listen to what we have in front of us. And that is, in 1990... Prince almost whispering at the beginning of the album Graffiti Bridge, the very first words you hear, Dear Dad, things didn't turn out quite like I wanted them to. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to explode. This was a remarkable thing for Prince to say on record. A different kind of confession than we were used to. It's also ambiguous. What, what things is he talking about? Why the anxiety, the frustration? We might be tempted to hear this speech as autobiographical, but we should be careful about that. After all, Graffiti Bridge is presented as a sequel to Purple Rain. Maybe it's not totally successful. We saw last night that maybe not all the actors even knew that that was the case. But as Prince Spreet speaks, he is reprising the role of the kid whose father, a violent, depressed, failed musician portrayed by Clarence Williams III, commits suicide near the end of the 1984 film. Excuse me. Prince's actual father was still very much alive, thankfully, and his presence can be felt in the film. For instance, given the film's subplot of the kid contemplating suicide is related to artistic and principled persistence and doubt, we might understand it as a metaphor. The first time the kid writes his deceased father, he says, so nobody wanted the music he was playing. So what? I was getting paid. We could have made it all right. Yes, yeah, sometimes I feel cursed to make the same mistake you made. The mistake refers to suicide, but also the kid's father's giving up on playing music, just like John L. Nelson actually did. In that Minneapolis Star Tribune article, Sharon Nelson recalls that her father didn't think his music was any good. Prince, in this sense, is left with the legacy of his father's thwarted desire contrasted with his own success. Either way you read this uh, twining of fact and fiction, there's a powerful sense in both the film and the album of legacy. The legacy Prince inherited from his parents, the legacy of the Black American working class, of the Black musicians who preceded and inspired Prince and his new powerful generation. And finally, the legacy of Prince's own career. This is a history of joy and struggle, advances and setbacks, of aspiration, risk, tradition, community. The person who carries all of this uh, carries the burden of expectations and uncertainty. Legacy isn't just about what you carry from the past into the present. It's about what you'll carry into the future and how you'll carry it when the road gets rocky. Purple Rain ends on that high note of success, um, the, uh, the hero over, having overcome his demons. Um, it's a Hollywood ending, right? Uh, everything's going to be just fine. Graffiti Bridge says, not so fast. Curtis Mayfield said, keep on keeping on. And here, Prince is asking, how? How do you do that? Graffiti Bridge is about many things, but perhaps we've overlooked that it's about conflict within the Black community over how to improve the community through class ideology and economic strategies at the intersection of art, literally. We all just watched it, so I'm not going to review the film's plot, except to rethink a little bit. 
For one thing, we have the legacy of black owned businesses. Since Glam Slam has been bequeathed to the kid and Morris by its previous owner, Billy Sparks, uh, who may have been cheap, but ran First Avenue uh, in Purple Rain. I read this as a vaguely imp- uh, as vaguely implying that the kid has changed the club's name from First Avenue to Glam Slam, attempting to pursue his ambitious utopian vision while still honoring Billy's wishes. Legacy. Billy, as an ancestor, symbolizes the dream of the civil rights generation, that their children get to the mountaintop, especially as it relates to economic prosperity and sovereignty. <clears throat> The civil rights generation and its music are also symbolized by gospel legend Mavis Staples as the matriarch Melody Cool, who I read as an idealized version of Prince's mother. All of the insight, uh, with all of the insight and devotion to the community and none of the babysitting money stealing activities that he described in The Beautiful Ones. There's also funk pioneer George Clinton, who was just named George, whose role is way too small for him, let me say. Uh, Each manages their own club at Seven Corners, what is literally an intersection of history and culture. I got to prepare myself because now we're going to talk about Morris Day. Then there's Morris Day as Morris, who owns the fourth club Pandemonium and owns controlling interest in Staples and Clinton's clubs and co-ownership in Glam Slam. He's willing to do whatever it takes to get control, including bombing Glam Slam at the start of the film. Watching Morris in 1990, um, it was easy to trace a historical line from the gangsters of Hollywood's golden age to the rising cultural figures of West Coast gangster rappers like Ice-T, N.W.A., and Ice Cube. I didn't know much about Zoot Suiters back then. There's an interesting connection here between criminal enterprises, a kind of parallel economy on the margins of so-called legitimate capitalist enterprise, Uh, And how black Americans being excluded from and oppressed by that so-called legitimate business world has encouraged or even at times necessitated participation in that parallel economy. And we see this then, of course, in Gangster Rap. As Robin D.G. Kelly writes in his chapter on G-Funk in the 1994 book Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, Gangster Rap was often a critique of the intersectionality of race and capitalism. Some gangster rappers, Ice Cube in particular, are especially brilliant at showing how, if I may paraphrase Marx, this is a quote from from Kelly, if I may paraphrase Marx, young urban black men make their own history, but not under the circumstances of their own choosing. Given the way that Graffiti Bridge unfolds, one could read Morris as a symbol of capitalism's potential corruption of the black working class as it aspires to climb into the middle class and beyond. That's not surprising. Prince often criticized materialism and a love for money instead of loving God and loving love. In the new, uh, but the nuance of Day's character, his portrayal, is one of my favorite things about this film. For instance, pressured by the city's government to pay ten thousand uh, dollars, Morris uh, berates his underling Cash, played by Jerome Benton, for fooling around at the club, and Jerome wonders why his boss is so irate. Morris calmly responds, "It ain't about mad; it's about discipline." Look, Cash, my family never had anything, and I intend to keep what I got. Morris Day is great in this role. His face carries so much doubt, self, uh, so much self-doubt, frustration, guilt, and determination. He is the mirror of the kid, both of them struggling to find the effective or the ethical way of carrying on the complicated dream of Black ownership, class mobility, community, and longevity, uh, and art in a society designed to thwart them. More than any other Prince album or film before it, Graffiti Bridge literally creates a multifaceted dialogue about class, capitalism, history, and art. It matters that the soundtrack and film rely so heavily on the adjacent styles and traditions in black music, funk, R&B, and gospel. While Glam Slam represents Prince's utopian vision via New Power Generation and Elephants and Flowers, which harkens to Around the World in a Day and is performed to a near-empty room, uh, the kid isn't the one trying to take over the clubs, right? Not only does Morris's possible takeover threaten Prince's innovation, his risk of trying new things to meet the present moment, all of the music from each club is likely to be, at the very least, commercialized or potentially erased. So two things about that I want to say. First, Morris also symbolizes capitalism's impulse towards standardization. Even if his accrued complete ownership of the other three clubs would stabilize them and keep them black owned, the film implies that his absolute grip would stifle artistic difference and end the dialogue. 
Secondly, it's an example of how capitalism seeks to commodify black multiplicity such that it exists uh, and plurality of art and aesthetics and politics, right? And how they can take it and then try to achieve this uh, standardization from within the black community. Now, this is Prince, all right? And this is a film which needs conflict and resolution. And so we see these socioeconomic tensions being resolved by tragedy, love, and God. But I think the film responds to the conflicts presented by capitalist standardization just by virtue of its music in two ways. One, what I just mentioned, black plurality. Graffiti Bridge not only re-embraced musical styles uh, traditionally associated with black Americans, it's an extremely diverse sounding album performed by four different lead acts outside of, uh, aside from Prince, um, which was a first for him, of course. Two, Prince still holds out that capitalism's desire for the new can be progressive and be churned against its own tendency towards sameness. In other words, art can change business. And let's be clear, Prince was still looking for a hit album and a successful film. So what's new? Hip hop. Yes, for sure. You've got the musical battle. You, you all understand that. Uh, but also, I do want to emphasize, even though it's been brought up a little bit, New Jack Swing, right? Popular eight, uh, 1980s hybrid of hip-hop's program beats and R&B crewing, uh, pioneered by Teddy Riley, Bernard Bell, and also, of course, let's not forget uh, the Times' own Jimmy Jam Lew uh, Harris, Terry Lewis, and Janet Jackson, and the album that they made, fantastic album, in 1986 called Control. Like Prince's music, New Jack Swing straddled the line between working class sonics and middle class aspiration. Bobby Brown rocks the turtleneck, let's not forget, on the cover of his 1990, 1988 hit album, Don't Be Cruel. And you can hear this in New Power Generation and Campbell's hit Round and Round. And of course, New Jack Swing was influenced by Minneapolis sound. Uh, Prince must have heard his own groundbreaking use of electronic drum sounds in it. So... Um, what we have here is a dialogue that's going on, and that dialogue is really important. Um, I want to end on a note here. Um, I'm about out of time, but I want to end on this note that part of that dialogue is Prince reflecting on his own legacy, thinking about himself. This is a sequel to Purple Rain. Graffiti Bridge vigorously embraces Black musical traditions and innovations, and its main cast is almost entirely Black. Nearly all of the songs he sings on the soundtrack revisit, revise, rearrange, or re-record older songs. Uh, and I don't need to go through this right now, but we can talk about them in the in the uh, Q and A. That this is happening in a, uh, in connection to a film that, while conceived in '87, was rewritten in 1989 and 1990 into this story at this moment in Prince's career is significant. I think that Prince was, for the first time in his career, understanding himself more explicitly as a historical subject, or at least explicitly putting that understanding onto film, onto record, so to speak. He was beginning to understand that, like anyone else, he was shaped by circumstances not of his own choosing. Even though he was a superstar, his fame had not liberated him from the systemically racist institution of capitalism faced by other Black Americans. What role might he play in a barely post in America? Um, that, I think, is the question that you can kind of see him asking in this film. How does his Christian faith operate, then, in this world of capitalism? What should art be? Graffiti Bridge is a subtle but turning, uh, crucial turning point in the evolution of Prince's class consciousness. It shows him situating himself into uh, these conflicts, affirming his ties to and love for Black America, and it subtly foreshadows his future critiques of American capitalism and how its white-dominated power structure exploits Black aspirations, innovations, and labor, and also... It also foreshadows his even greater efforts at building self-sufficient Black-owned businesses and common purpose. Thank you very much.